family, all our regular viewers and new viewers. It's great to have you join us in worship and praise this morning. We want you to know you are loved and appreciated and God loves you immeasurably. If you are in need of someone to talk to or have a prayer need, please contact us at the church Monday to Friday or submit your prayer requests to us from the Regina app website. Well, we want to encourage you today with a scripture reading out of the Psalms. So grab your Bibles and turn to Psalm 136. Even when we're feeling a little down, we can still praise God, even in the midst of trouble. We know that the joy of the Lord is not the absence of pain or trials. So as we enter into worship, let's give thanks to God, and as there's always something to be thankful for. As Psalm 136 says, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his mercy endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his mercy endures forever. The psalmist goes on for 26 verses to state God's mercy endures forever. So let's praise God for his mercy today and his very great goodness. Amen. Well, it's good to see you this morning. We're going to start by worshiping God and we're going to celebrate what he has done for us. Amen. He lived and he died and he paid the price for us. Man, this song's called You Have Won Me. Let's just worship along with us today.
Jesus. with you today. It's good to see you. Some of you have changed a little bit over the last year or so. <laughs> I see some of you, but it's really good to see your faces again. Uh, we're going to sing a new song. Uh, it's called Act Justly, Love Mercy. It's new to us here anyways. And uh, you know, Micah 6, 8 says, the Lord has shown me, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of me, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. So as we sing this song this morning, Keep that verse in mind. Let's just worship the Lord in His presence today. Goes like this. All comes down to this. What you require of me. Love my neighbor as myself. And you above all things. And just me. Love mercy.
Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Children, may His favor be upon you and a thousand.
Hey everyone, whether you're with us in person or joining us online, just a couple announcements to keep you up to date. We just wanna say a big congratulations to all our grade 12 graduates. If you know one of the grads, why don't you reach out to them, encourage them, pray for them as they transition to them in this next season of life. We're grateful for each one of you. Hey, if you're interested in contributing to the mission of Regina Apostolic Church, there are multiple ways you can give, whether it's online or in person. Check out www.reginaapp.com give for all the electronic methods and online. If you're with us in person, there's an offering slot at the reception desk as you first come in. As well, at the end of service, you can drop that off there. Friends, a big announcement, July 11th. Obviously, the government just released that all pro remaining protocols will be lifted. So we're going to be relaunching two new service times on Sundays at 9.15 a.m. and 11 a.m. So mark that on your calendars, July 11th, Sunday. There will be two new service times, 9.15 a.m. and 11 a.m. Obviously, all remaining um, restrictions and protocols will be lifted at that time. A special note as well, July 11th, we're going to be having the Reverend Larry Moore come and bring the Word of God that Sunday. Larry's been put forward as our lead pastor candidate, so you're going to want to come hear what's on his heart. As well, take note, Sunday evening on July 11th, there will be a meeting at 6 p.m., a town hall for the church just to come and hear what's on his heart for RIC. So make note of that. July 11th is a pretty special Sunday. We're looking forward to seeing you all. We're anticipating all the good things God's going to do in this next season. Okay, many blessings, friends. You take care. Yeah, I'm so glad you're watching today because I have some good news that I want to share with you. But I also have some not so good news. The good news I'm eager to share with you, though, is in fact more than good. It's great news. Even better than great, it happens to be incredible news. However, the not so good news might come across to you as bad news, depending on how you hear it and how you receive it. You know, I personally think it's disturbing news that is quickly becoming, for me, disruptive news. And it's adjusting the way I think and live. And once you hear it, ponder it, and come to understand it, and take the time to really think through its consequences and influence, it might just change the way you think and live, too. I sure hope it does. And I hope it disturbs your soul a bit. This news, both the good and the bad parts of it, might break your heart. You know, there's something in it that should wreck your soul in a good way. It may even cause you some lack of sleep at night. But in those waking moments or hours of the night, God may just awaken to you something new and momentous that you've never thought of or dreamed of before, or perhaps to something that you've been dreaming of for a long time. And one more thing. If you grab hold of this news, it will, not might, not should, but will stir your heart to action and move you to a deeper place of compassion. Now, by now, you're probably wondering what this good news is and what the not-so-good news is. Well, I'll start with the good, followed by the not-so-good, and then end my message today by reiterating the good news. First, God promised this good news. The good news is about His Son, Jesus Christ. The good news is that we have been called to belong to Jesus Christ and that we are loved by God. The good news is that the power of God is at work in our lives, saving everyone who believes, making us right in His sight. You know, the good news is that it's a work of faith by grace from start to finish when we place our faith in Jesus. And it's true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are or what our background is, what we've done or what we've gone through. So the good news is that God is faithful and he is always fair, even when we are not. Now for the not so good news, the bad news. All have sinned. All people are under the power of sin, and that sin seeks to keep us separated and distant from God, void of the abundant eternal life he offers us in Christ. We all fall short of God's standard. We have no excuse. God has shown us what we need to see and what we need to know. The entire world is guilty before God, and we need an advocate to stand before the judge on our behalf to make a request for our acceptance and acquittal. You see, the bad news is that sin must be judged. It cannot be overlooked. Simply trying to live right won't cut it. 
No one can ever be made right with God by doing everything that the law commands or by always acting good. The law shows us how sinful we are and how inadequate our works are. The bad news is that our lives, apart from God, are depicted by four main characteristics. Sinfulness, self-centeredness, self-righteousness, and stubbornness. And each of these four characteristics is a barrier to experiencing a fulfilling and flourishing life and to encountering God's peace. Each characteristic contains a certain degree of striving, and each is in its own way stifling. Each one of these four traits also requires grace and humility and perseverance to overcome. And I'll come back to each of these characteristics in a moment. But first, I want to give you a brief overview of how we're going to approach our messages throughout the summer months. You know, this summer, we will be preaching out of the book of Romans. And we'll be highlighting key passages and themes you know, Rome was a city that was filled with a diversity of cultural, relational, and spiritual dynamics. And for many years, Paul had desired to visit Rome and to minister there. Some speculate that Paul was hoping to use Rome as a base for his missionary venture into Spain. And others pose that Paul wrote the letter to believers in Rome with an apologetic purpose, thus containing a description and a defense of the faith in a rather faithless and self-focused society. Either way, the book of Romans is rich with truth that speaks to God's overall plan of redemption and salvation and reconciliation and transformation. As we dive into the book of Romans over the summer months, Take note of the recurring topics of faith and works, law and grace, sin and righteousness, judgment and justification. You know, Romans contains one of the most comprehensive and systematic explanations of the gospel and the importance of grace in the life of the believer. It outlines what justification by faith looks like without giving permission or license to live in sin. It's a book that highlights the plan of God for God's people that not only establishes our foundation of faith, but focuses equally on how our faith relates to everyday Christian life. Romans is a book about God's law and God's love, God's judgment and His grace, God's justice and His mercy, and our response to each of these in the playground of life. You know, like the old playground teeter-totter. You know, the dangerous pole in the middle of the playground with the seats on either end? It's not about trying to strike a balance between two seemingly opposite thoughts or beliefs. But think of them as our ups and downs. But as, as we navigate our way through life, it's about learning to live simultaneously within the rhythm of both truth and grace, law and love, justice and mercy. You know, the book of Romans includes themes of God's faithfulness, righteousness, and reconciliation that are marked by Paul's concern for racial reconciliation as well as cultural sensitivity. He provides for us uh, advice on resolving personal and internal conflict, lists Christ's attitude as the example for us, and teaches that Jesus' love for what our neighbor is what ultimately fulfills the law's intent. The book of Romans points to Christ, the divine power of the Holy Spirit that enables Christians to live righteous lives here and now through faith in Jesus. So let's go back to the four characteristics now that hinder us from experiencing a flourishing life in Christ. What is it that gets in the way? And what holds us back? First, we need to look at sinfulness. And sinfulness communicates this. I'm utterly dead without the life of Christ in me. See, the Bible tells us in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul also reminds us in Ephesians of a sobering fact. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. See, the Lord himself admonished Cain while in a fit of raging anger toward his brother Abel that sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. 
Sin as a way of creating unnecessary burden and brokenness. Whereas God's divine gift to us is meant for the sake of blessing as we receive and as we give. And when we think of sinfulness, it's easy to identify the sins of others and to point fingers. And in fact, it's too easy. But we must continually remind ourselves that we're no different and we're no better. Sin is sin. So before we go judging the sins of others and condemning people for their so-called sinful actions, we had better pause for a moment to check our own hearts and put down the accusatory stone that we're about to throw. And rather than throw the stone, set it down, ask the Holy Spirit to soften our heart and replace um, that cold place with the heart of flesh, with compassion and mercy and grace and love. You know, very little is said or preached about sin today. Worse, when it is, we tend to close our ears and shut down our heart when the word sin is used in any public context. Perhaps we fear being exposed. Or maybe we fear being condemned. Or we fear being challenged. Or we fear being stirred to change. Or perhaps we fear opening our hearts to being used as a conduit of grace in a place of rescue and refuge for others who equally struggle with their own disgrace of sin. Now, these are natural fears that we must confront as Christians and meet with compassion as composed to condemnation. You know, we must face these fears head on if we're to walk victorious in the grace of Christ upon our lives. You know, I love what the Apostle Paul writes in the fifth verse of his letter to the church in Rome. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege. It's another way to might say it is grace and authority as apostles to tell everyone, everywhere, what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you were included among the everyone who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. You see, when you get it, you'll want to share it because you'll want everyone else to get it. See, so the good news of redemption and salvation in Christ is personal and the transformation that follows through the power of the Holy Spirit as he is at work in our lives. It's meant to be life-shaping. It's meant to be contagious and it's meant to spread. But sin always wants to remain covered and hidden. And that leads us to the second characteristic, which is self-centeredness. Self-centeredness communicates this. I'm utterly self-consumed without the love and compassion of Christ leading me. I recently read a quote from this book that I've been slowly working my way through. It's called Wrecked. When a Broken World Slams Into Your Comfortable Life. It's written by Jeff Goins. It's a quote that makes so much sense to me. It says this, We who are rich with respect to the rest of the world must come to grips with our own poverty if we are going to make a difference. We must allow our hearts to be broken so that we can make things whole once again. We must fall apart before we can build up. Anything else is not compassion. We must fall apart before we can build up. Anything else is not compassion. See, I'm beginning to see something in that that I confess I wish I had taken note of much earlier in my life. It's only when we begin to fully understand and appreciate and never take for granted the Father's gift of salvation given to us that we will freely offer and share that gift of abundant life in Christ to others. Salvation is a gift that's to be modeled through compassion and action. It's too easy to concentrate on our own wants and needs. That we lean towards self-centeredness, but Scripture points us towards Christ-centeredness. Christ is our anchor and our hope and our provision and our strength. We try to fix our own weakness and brokenness with every um, you know, try, type of success, but God's grace is sufficient. If only we believe that to the extent that it would change our focus from me to he. Romans chapter 1 describes the heart condition of humanity. It's pretty ugly, let me tell you. It's dirty. It's empty without Christ. It's not about the kind of sin that we should worry about. It's about the kind of heart that we have that should concern us most. And thankfully, despite our sin, Christ reached into that place with his loving kindness to lift us up and pull us out. 
Because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in response to our self-centered nature, Paul writes this, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sins? Our response should be one of reciprocating to others the very kindness and mercy that Christ has shown us. And by doing so, we have the privilege of lifting others up and pulling them out of their sinful and self-centered place rather than pushing them further in due to our lack of humility and insensitivity. And that leads me to the third characteristic, which is self-righteousness. And this is a tough one because we all want to be right And if the truth be told, not one of us wants to be called out. But the Bible is clear on this point. No one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise, and no one is seeking God. Ouch! All have turned away. All have become useless. And no one does good, not a single one. Again, ouch! See, those words sting, but they're true. In every aspect, true. Paul goes on to say they don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Human tendency apart from God is to create our own form of righteousness based on our own standard of rightness and justice. But it's flawed because every standard then competes against another standard which creates nothing but confusion and chaos. Therefore, nothing is right and nothing is just. It's just a big mess. Self-righteousness says my life is hopeless and all my efforts to attain a sense of rightness and worthiness on my own are useless and meaningless outside of Christ. And I need a new standard, a standard that's perfect and preference-free. I need a set of life-governing laws and principles that hold me accountable to live based on what I know. And that's where Christ comes into the picture. God's standard is predetermined. It's perfect. It's not preferential. Righteousness is is focused on Christ, not on our efforts or merits. The Bible says that God is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. But we naturally gravitate toward things like status and position and heritage and fame and all those in a way are good, but they're not good enough. And the enemy plays in our mind, um, making us think that we need to be superior or beyond or above something. And the secret thoughts plague us and push us toward further self-imposed righteous efforts. And if we're not careful, they can lead us down a dark path that's lined with pride and self-seeking glory. And Paul addresses this. And he says, and this is the message I proclaim. That the day is coming when God, through Christ Jesus, will judge everyone's secret life. Jesus is the one appointed by God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. Everyone must make their own personal choice regarding the opportunity to either receive or reject the grace God has given in Christ. The good news is that everyone who believes in him and all who embrace and receive this grace beyond their own merit and effort will have their sins forgiven through his name. Now let me put it this way. If you grew up in a Christian home, that's fantastic. You know, there are many blessings of growing up in a loving home and in being saturated each day in a caring, supportive environment with parents who have modeled for you godly virtues and values. And as good as this is, it doesn't automatically make you a loving, caring, supportive person who will emulate those same godly virtues and values in your own life any more than growing up in a Christian home makes you a Christian. You must make that decision for yourself. No one can make that choice for you. And like it or not, you will be held accountable for that choice. Yet we resist the idea of accountability. We prefer freedom, freedom of choice, of life, of consequence even. But it's impossible to enjoy the freedom without knowing where the freedom boundary exists. Here's another example. And it pertains to rules of the road. Driver safety is taught before we ever make our way behind the driver's seat. At least that's how it should work. I studied my driver's manual and learned the rules of the road before I ever made my way onto the road with my dad in the passenger seat. 
Uh, thankfully, he was patient with me, and as I uh, embraced the process of discovering the joy of driving freely on my own. You know, the rules of the road provided the boundary for safe driving, but simply learning the how-tos of driver safety is not the same as navigating firsthand through traffic. The rules of the road are far more than educational instruction to be learned. They contain foundational laws that must be adhered to and obeyed. And God's word provides the boundary line, the foundational laws, not meant to hinder, but are designed to help us flourish. His word aligns us to his will. It's in the context of his will that our lives are most free. And that leads to the fourth characteristic, which is stubbornness. Now, when we think of stubbornness, this is what it communicates. My attempt for resilience is futile if my heart responds with increasing resistance rather than openness and receptivity to the life-giving grace and strength and peace of Christ that comes through faith and trust in him. Stubbornness quite simply says, I can do it on my own, and I'll do it my way. Essentially, it pushes others off to the side and out of the way, even God, indicating that I'm in charge. And that's the problem, because we are not the final authority. God is. Our lives are designed for relationship. Sin gets in the way. Self-centeredness gets in the way. Self-righteousness wants to rule. And stubbornness resists what we cannot oversee or control. Life in Christ begins with that humble spirit that recognizes the danger of these characteristics outside of Christ. It acknowledges that all have sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Life in Christ reaches out in faith, embracing the kindness of God shown in the grace that's offered. And for a moment, let's go back, make our way to the good news again. See, it may seem bleak to think that all have sinned and realize how sin mars and hinders our lives from the fullness of God's love. And it may disturb you, as it does me, how sin suppresses the truth about God, even though it's obvious in the observance of creation. It may be difficult to understand, yet somehow illogically understandable, how God would abandon people to do whatever shameful things their, or may, let's make it more personal, our deceitful, stony heart desires. God's heart breaks to have to do such a thing. God's heart breaks over refusal and a resistant spirit. It seems on the surface to be heartless and merciless, yet God has no other recourse. He has given humanity a free will that he will not override. God's heart breaks over the damage that sin causes to the human soul. And he breaks over the destructive nature that the human soul poses to others. But it's that same broken heart of God that comes to the defense of our sinful depravity in the sending of Christ as our rescue and pardon from sin's grip upon our soul. You see, the good news is this. We are accepted by God and fully acquitted of all sin in Christ. For God was in Christ reconciling the world back to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin, to become sin itself, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. In essence, Christ is not only the payment for our sin, but he is also the pardon for our sin, past, present, and future. And this is the good news. And if you've never responded to this good news, today is your opportunity. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that the favor of the Lord can come upon you. And it's as simple as calling out to the Lord. It's as simple as reaching out to Him knowing that he is calling you. He is calling your name. And he's just simply saying to you, come, follow me. And if you are willing today to do that, and you recognize that, that you, your life is stained with sin, but there is grace and there is forgiveness and there is peace in Christ today. Jesus invites you to come to him and all he is asking is that you would invite him into your life and receive his grace and receive his forgiveness.
Would you pray with me if this is you? And let us know if you pray this prayer with me. Let us know. And someone from the church here, me or one other of our pastors or someone from our church will contact you and we would love to begin walking with you and helping you on your journey of faith. Just pray this prayer. Jesus, today I recognize that I need you that my life has been apart from you. But I invite you today into my life to become my Savior and my Lord. I receive your grace by faith, and I accept that. And thank you that you call me and that you welcome me and that you forgive me of my sin. Today, fill me with your Holy Spirit and set me on a new journey of faith in you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. If you prayed that prayer, please let us know. Amen. Hey, thanks again for watching. We trust you were encouraged, inspired, and maybe even a bit challenged by the message this week. Why not take a moment, even right now, and share this video with someone you know? Or post it on your Facebook page. Give someone else an opportunity to experience what you have today. Well, we'd love for you to stay connected with our Sunday gatherings, either in person or online. For service times and registration, as well as information about our children's and youth programs and upcoming events at the church, visit us at reginaapp.com. If you're looking to connect into a small group to get involved in the life of our church in any way, we'd love to help you find a spot that fits you best. Pastor Llewellyn would love to work with you to get you connected. Just send a quick email to getconnected at reginaapp.com. So thanks again for watching, and be a friend to someone this week. Reach out with a text or make a call. Your voice may be just what's needed to brighten someone's day. God bless, and have a great week. Thank you.